In a culture of wild political correctness, Echo of Fidelity brings you godly content and a godless world. From thought-provoking interviews to inspirational stories of saints and heroes, this show is always deeply rooted in Catholic tradition. This is Echo of Fidelity. Music. Can music change the way we think, act, and believe? This question can be answered by Mr. Philip Calder, an accomplished musician and composer. In his fascinating talk, The Power of Music, he explains the history of music from the Middle Ages until our days, showing how music shapes society for good or for evil. We decided to record this talk for our listeners, so here it is. Enjoy. This presentation has been given over the years in different formats. Uh, one of the earlier ones was called From Gregorian Chant to Guitar Masses, The Revolution in the History of Music. It basically is going to trace the uh, process, revolutionary process, uh, from the time of the Middle Ages down to the present, and how that process gradually um, affected and uh, essentially destroyed uh, the great music. Absolutely the inspiration for this is the great and seminal work by Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira, Revolution and Counter-Revolution. I uh, heartily recommend you get this book and study it, because it is from this book that sheds the light and the inspiration for the whole thesis that you're going to, and the analysis that you're going to hear today. For example, my own background as a professional musician, when I came in contact with this book and learned it, begin to learn of it deeply, it was from that that I could uh, focus on all the things of music that I had known before but from his point of view, revolution and counter-revolution. Starting from the thesis that the Middle Ages was a golden time, okay, not a time uh, as the uh, universities would have people believe, a time of darkness, but rather the time of light. As St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas said, uh, the Lumen Christi, the light of Christ, was over the whole society. Uh, what he meant was there were more saints living in the time of the Middle Ages than any other time. It was because of that that you see how the light and the beauty of the Middle Ages uh, how it came forth from that. Let's start from an example of a music from the height of the Middle Ages. Actually, it undoubtedly came before, but um, the great chants in the church, Gregorian chant, expresses very well the beauty, the order of that glorious time. I will start with uh, Agnus Dei, Lamb of God. I'll do first as a single, unaccompanied, uh, and then I'll put an accompany with it. So keep in mind that that uh, single without a company is what we call homophony. It's just one line, which is the nature of chant. It's just one line. On you stay, we told this peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Accompanied. On you stay, we told this peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Non nobis facem. All right, so you see a tremendous beauty harmony, calm, serenity, all the elements, the attributes that, you could, that we could imagine in God, his infinite perfections, you hear, you see reflected in that chant. I will uh, give another example of the, the beauty of that time. Ave Maria, 
gratia plenum, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, nunc ed in ora mortis nostre, The, the perfect temperance, the perfect order. Nothing is out of place, you see, everything in balance. Mm -mm. One of the great saints that showed this uh, monarchic principle so well was great Saint Louis the Ninth of France. And I have here, I'll just do an, a short excerpt of the music that was played for his coronation. As imagine this, this, this king coming in, the cathedral of Rheims, you know, with his trumpets and everything, you know, and the whole ceremony. If you break this down into two elements, just imagine the, the theme, this could be a chant. I'm just, and the inflection would depend on what words you set to it. But you see, that could qualify as a chant, single line, or the bass. Could, could be one of the chants. Put them together, you have harmony. You have the beginning and counterpoint. You have one line against another. With this music, you also have a more, <coughs> what's been termed as a, a rhythmic posture according to the way Western music developed. Chant has a more delicate and, and, and nuanced rhythm, not according to a precise meter. This meter, or, or, or time signature, you could say, would be in 2-4. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, right? That's it. So that is a regular meter. Anyway, with the rhythmic posture, you have two lines combined. Etc. So you have the beginning of the development of music. At this juncture, let's bring in uh, a concept some of you may have heard, it's called the four attributes of being. Anything that God has created has these four attributes of being. In Latin they are the unum, the verum, the bonum, and the pulchrum. Or in English, the oneness, the truthfulness or the truth, the goodness, and the beauty. A new state with all his peccata muni, miserere novi. It's easy to see the oneness or the unum in that. It's, it's one line. So a chant is, is perfectly suited to express the unum of things. When I put the accompaniment to it, a new state. It still forms a oneness. In other words, the elements here of the melody and the harmony, they work, they work perfectly to form a oneness. Imagine if I did this. On you stay, we told this peccata. Blue Danube of Strauss. That's a beautiful piece. There's nothing bad in itself in the Blue Danube, do you understand? But if I do the Blue Danube in the middle of this chant, I have broken the unum, is it understood? There's no way they can go together. The only way they can go together is before going to the, uh, listen to the Blue Danube or have an elegant wall, everybody goes to the high mass, we hear the Agonius Day, the way it's supposed to be. Then you come to the palace, and then, then you have the blue danube. Uh, the truthfulness basically could be uh, defined as something 
uh, used for its proper end. We can use the uh, the Agnus Dei again if you want. But now, supposing in the middle of the palace with the blue denim, I would do something like this. Make a version of the Agnus Dei. I broke the truthfulness because the, the Agnus Dei is not meant to be done. It's not, I'm not denouncing the Blue Danube. I'm saying that the Agnus Dei is not intended to be done next to the Blue Danube. Bonum. The Bonum is the goodness. Something has to have a good intent. It cannot have an evil intent. The fourth uh, aspect, the pulchrum, the beauty. If something f uh, is faithful to the first three, the unum has unum, truthfulness, and goodness, it has all the possibilities to be beautiful. So therefore, uh, something that does not have unum, uh, verum, and bonum cannot be beautiful. You could give a non-musical example. For example, uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame. Magnificent architecture. Imagine if outside of one of those buttresses is a red barn built right onto the cathedral. But a beautiful red barn, rustic, nice farm, well-kept, clean, and beautiful like you'd find in countryside of France. There's nothing wrong with the barn. <laughs> the cathedral is magnificent. They could never be put together. You see, this is an example of something that would break the unum of the cathedral and the barn, because the barn has its own unum. It would break the truthfulness, because neither one would be used uh, uh, there for its, its true end. It would break the goodness, because you, you're doing something that you should not for an evil intent, and therefore that would not be beautiful. Is it clear? Professor Flinio Cradle Berry, in his book, puts the beginning of the what, what he calls the downfall, the gradual downfall of the Middle Ages at, the, at 1300, 1300, 1308, when Pope Boniface VIII was slapped in the face by the emissary of Philip the Fair, terrible thing. And he died a couple, uh, shortly thereafter, okay? Uh, not because of this so much, but because of the, what that meant in the in the spiritual sphere what that meant what a, what a terrible thing that was this gave rise for 250 years 225 years to what the secular universities love to call <coughs> uh, the great time the renaissance rebirth etc the renaissance actually from the point of view we're looking at was a, not a renaissance of good things, but a, a renewal of interest in humanism, putting man at the center instead of God at the center. And we're not just talking about in the religious sphere. We're talking about in the temporal society. St. Louis IX was everything he was because of the Catholic Church. There's not a separation between the Holy Catholic Church and the monarchy of St. Louis IX, not a bit of it. He was what he was. St. Joan was what she was, and so forth. All St. Thomas Aquinas, those great lights, of the, they were what they were because of the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church exerted a profound and deep influence over everything, of all of man's activities. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it has gone, I will see with this process, it has gone on for generations. Even to the present day, there are some things of that left. That shows how long it has taken to try to erase the influence of the Holy Catholic Church. The development of music at the height of the Middle Ages was actually very simple. I played you this. Can't lose the line. This is a very simple piece. Uh, on the other hand, some of the other arts like painting and sculpture were much more developed so that they felt the impact and, and the deterioration of the Renaissance much quicker than music. 
I, that's why the the painters already of the Renaissance were were painting a lot of paintings. You cannot uh, <laughs> you cannot look at the paintings. Uh, now skipping ahead, 1525 to 1594 were the dates of the great Palestrina. So when we say Palestrina is a Renaissance uh, church composer, keep in mind it doesn't mean with the errors of the Renaissance, because. His great achievement was because he still had a powerful push from the Catholic things. This is, um, we adore thee, O Lord. Imagine voices. Can be with organ too if you want, or just voices. You can imagine sitting in a, in a cathedral, the penumbra of a cathedral, the sun streaming through those great uh, stained glass windows. It, it speaks of a quality we call transcendental. But what that shows us is it, it, it's a vision of heaven. It, it, it speaks of something beyond the actual thing that you're seeing, okay? And the actual music, that, it transformed you transcendental quality. Uh, this music, <clears throat> uh, this type of music, which was the proper development of the beauty of the unum of the chant into more variety. The great St. Pius X at the beginning of the 20th century, he referred to this music saying it had the perfect oneness, unum, with the variety. It had the unity in the variety. A favorite composer from this period of Professor Plinio was Corelli. Here, you're talking about uh, Palestrina uh, uh, passed on in 1594. Corelli, 1653 to 1713. Very elevated, no? You see how that is going a little farther than Palestrina. With those composers, going all the way up to, in, in, the, in the instance of Corelli, passing on in 1713, music was still very good. Now I want to back, a little bit back, to 1517, that dreaded moment in history, European history, where Luther organized his revolt. If there's a problem in the church, we need to analyze it and see how to fix it with the grace of God. But that's a different thing altogether than what Luther did. The people who don't have good spirit seek to uh, find something wrong with the church in order to overthrow it. That's exactly what Luther did. And by the way, <coughs> He was also talented as a musician. His, his, his famous hymn, which became kind of the hymn of the Protestant Reformation, God forbid, uh, is not a bad piece. A uh, mighty fortress is our God. Uh, just organ, I think, would be sufficient for this.
the corral, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's decent enough. But you see, in the hands of somebody like this, and with all the revolutionary fervor that got behind Luther, uh, this became uh, the vanguard, him, uh, to overthrow Catholicism. And Luther, I, all of you have heard stories about Luther ended up not only overthrowing his vows as a priest, he took a nun, married the nun, okay, and it was, was really, really very, very bad. He did things like, for example, once he said to the, to the nun, former nun, his wife, uh, they had a fire. Uh, see that? He said, I took her hand, put, put it there. <laughs> Get used to that. Another, of course, a very bad example happened right at the around the same time as Luther, a little bit afterwards, uh, of uh, Henry VIII. We all know this. He was once very good. He was given the title of Defender of the Faith. And because he didn't uh, stay focused on God and God's law and got the idea that, well, you know, a king is supposed to have a... Uh, a, uh, a, an heir, and when his wife, the legitimate wife, Catherine, didn't produce a male heir, locked her in the tower. You all know the, know the story. And then began taking one woman after another, and uh, conveniently, when one didn't give an heir, cut the head off of her. He disobeyed the Pope, who said, you cannot have an annulment. That was his, that was his crossroads, right? <laughs> He had the chance there to say, okay, who am I to go against uh, 1,500 years of tradition? I cannot. Our Lord himself said, marriage is indissoluble. He's decreed, Henry the decreed, okay, since the Pope is not going to acknowledge this and he has to have an heir, divine right of king. Henry VIII is now the head of the church in England. Okay, that's where the bad idea of this divine right of kings. Kings can have a divine origin, uh, a God bless them, but that doesn't mean they can do everything they want no matter what. Anybody who opposed Henry VIII, right? So they apostatized, the whole lot of them, as well as the English people. And you have that disaster uh, per, uh, per, uh, perpetuating until today. What happened was there were a few souls that stood up like blessed John Fisher, and the other great one who didn't accept, very famous, was Henry VIII's chancellor, St. Thomas, Thomas More, who became the saint. There's a film very worthwhile watching. It's called The Man for All Seasons. It came out in 1960. The music from that, I don't know who did the music, and I don't know how they got it, but they really captured the drama of that uh, epic passage in, in history. very exciting and it comes to different parts of the theme in the film and it, it, it shows the um, the approaching tragedy the uh, the heroism of St. Thomas More it shows the uh, still the backdrop of all the what was left of the seriousness that the church gave to society it's a quote again from Professor Polinia's revolution contra revolution he calls it the the revolution in the tendencies well anything that doesn't have a, something good about it, has something bad about it, and if it's not made explicit, that is going to uh, start a process in all the people that are exposed to that. It's the tendency, the tendency that we have. So it first appears as a tendency, and then the second is, from the tendencies, it passes to an idea. If someone comes along and says, you know, the idea behind that is this. Then that's much more specific. Then people either have to accept that idea or reject it or whatever, but as soon as it becomes an idea, it is going farther than just a suggestion. And in the third stage, it becomes a revolution in the facts. 
it becomes then those ideas promote an actual, uh, well, if it's a revolutionary thing, an evil thing. This can also be worked for the good. So tendency, the work and tendency can be for the good. In the case of the revolution, it's always uh, to pull people away. Now I'm going to j jump ahead to the great Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685 to 1750. One of the most important things that I believe one learns from studying the works of this uh, great gentleman here, as well as viewing the Catholic uh, things in history, is to see the, 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 the importance of the new ones, not making a general statement. Of course, you have a general idea about things, good or bad. But within that, there's a lot of nuance, and it's important to see the nuance. So, for example, Bach could, uh, 150 more years after Luther's revolt, come up with the, uh, the B minor mass. Bach had one of the, his gift from God, one of the greatest musical minds in history. So one of the effects of Protestantism is, is, to, is to change the transcendental aspect of Catholicism, properly re, uh, repre represented, like we talked about the Gal uh, Palestrina, the transcendental, uh, uh, which is up. The Catholic view is this way, seeing all the beautiful hierarchies of God until they finally the highest you can go in them, God is forever about that. Okay. The, the, so Catholic view is this. What happened with the Protestantism in music uh, and, and society was something like their architecture. You know, one of the reforms that the Protestants, they, they would take a Catholic church, they'd take it over, and the, the high sp uh, uh, spires, the th just cut it off. So makes it like this. It shows very well in architecture the Protestant influence of egalitarianism, making everything equal, more positivistic. It's like this. Just looking at what you can touch or see rather than the transcendental. So in this, I would call it, in other terms, psh, magnificent Kyrie. When you hear this with the choir and the orchestra, you say, wow. But nevertheless, splitting hairs, A little bit like this. Do you see that? It's it's like this. Rather than like this. Do you see that? It's a subtle thing. Somebody may say, "My goodness, who does this man think he is finding something wrong with box B minor mass?" I'm not doing that. I am opening. I'm trying to suggest other more more. Uh, nuanced analysis, so it's not just to put everything the same. I s preface by saying Bach was one of the greatest musicians that ever lived, and he did a magnificent thing. Very innocent, also very innocent. Look at this uh, this beautiful hymn he did for uh, for uh, for East uh, for Christmas. Yea, the joy of man's desire. Or something. Part of this effect also of Protestantism is a certain, certain kind of fate, fatal, uh, fatalistic thing. I'm not, uh, I'm really splitting hairs here, okay? The very famous Bach the Cotton Fugue.
did this in a big church organ. My goodness, wow. And he, he did so much magnificent organ music. Wow, it's just tremendous. The thing is this, that it has a little bit of that. Do you see what I'm saying? A little bit. I'm not giving 100% ratification to this. Maybe 90%. A great contemporary of, Han of Bach, which I cannot uh, resist, we have to acknowledge a little bit, George Frederick Handel, was born the same year as Bach, 1685, nevertheless lived another nine years after Bach. So Bach was 65, and so Handel was in his mid 70s. Handel was the, uh, not born in England, but he ended up going to England and became the court composer for the King of England, King George. I would say Handel had one of his greatest gifts was majesty. You can see that very well in some of the music he wrote, the coronation anthems for King George. And uh, he, they, they had words, and took, he took the words from Zodak the priest in the Old Testament. Anyway, you, you have to, this is just a pale idea, but when you hear that with the strings gradually, go, da, 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 and then door, and the, the chorus come, the trumpets, it's majestic. And of course, Handel wrote the, the great Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A magnificent thing. That Hallelujah chorus from the Messiah, that is inspired. I mean, he wrote the whole Messiah in 24 days. Split the hair here a little bit. If you compare Bach and Handel, well, they're two giants. I would say Bach is a greater composer. There's more to Bach's music than, than in Handel's, but Handel had much more sense of majesty. We could characterize the Protestant Reformation as the first huge convulsion in this revolutionary process of 600 years. No? The second immense convulsion was the French Revolution. As the religion deteriorated, the religious sense deteriorated, even though not, the religion didn't change in France, but this effect over society was, was terrible, was like a poison. And the other thing that came into uh, play here was the so-called Age of Enlightenment. We've all studied some of Rousseau and Voltaire, uh, who were very smart people, but they used that smartness to uh, basically make fun of Catholic things and poke fun at it and, 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 and enter in this Age of uh, Enlightenment, supposedly human reason being supreme. A very famous piece that emerged from then um, the composer is almost known for nothing else. Baccarini's Minuet. So, I, and I use a simulation of the harpsichord. <coughs> harpsichord I uh, plucked the strings like this. So it also had a very aristocratic, a certain combination of aristocratic and militant sound to it, the harpsichord. Bach died 1750. Mozart, 1756, was born. 
lived to 1791. In that period, right in there, uh, the piano started to come into, into being. The piano became the in Mozart's keyboard instrument. And the difference between the piano and the harpsichord was that with the mechanism of the piano, a hammer striking the string instead of plucking it, uh, it was also equipped to be sensitive to the touch. So, see, so you could do this, or... Get a full range of dynamics just at the touch of your fingers. One, one example, I'll take a very famous piece of Mozart, which expresses very well in music, uh, it is a principle of the inequality, harmonious inequality is good, and that you have to have it. It's not a question of opinion. This is very famous C major sonata. Um, he wrote this like three years before the end of his life, which was a short life, 35 years. Mozart was like a meteor that just, oh, like a star. Anyway, here's this, a little bit of this. The innocence. Huh? Let's take the melody. There are two elements here, melody and accompaniment. Melody. Accompaniment. Which is superior? Obviously the melody. If you try to do this by itself, would say, well, okay, you studied some piano, but you cannot go very long with this. However, when you do the two together, the two together are greater than the melody by itself. The harmonious inequality is a kind of, uh, as St. Thomas alluded, <clears throat> is a kind of golden key to unlock the way God created the universe. You notice when I'm playing this, because the melody is superior, I give that more tone than the accompaniment. The accompaniment was less, right? And imagine if I turned it around. do that. That's out of order. That is inequality, but the one who is supposed to support is all the time thinking about, why do I have to support? I, I You know, I, I have a place on this too. A person who doesn't recognize their place to serve. In the end, everyone has to serve. Everything has to serve. And every good thing has to serve something. In the end, which is a way to serve God. That is the person carrying the melody with the right attitude. Mozart, in the end of his life, he heard the, he heard the famous Dia Sire. Mozart, he said, wow. I would have ex gladly exchanged everything I'd written to have just written this Dia Sire. That's the admiration he had for that chant. Uh, that certainly was in his mind when he began his last work, which is a, 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 a requiem and is in D. have to hear it. Another great uh, musical talent was, was uh, emerging, Beethoven. Born seven, his life crossed Mozart's. Born 1750, 1770 to 1827. So their lives crossed like this. The other things that was happening was something like pro uh, positivism, but moving gradually farther, which is naturalism. And so Beethoven, one of his Sonatas in his early period, number 14, uh, he played, it came like this.
Now, the third movement of this same sonata, I would say, aptly depicts another thing. Beethoven was rather gruff in his treatment, and of course he had to be friends with the nobility. If we, d if we did not have the nobility at the time of Mozart and Beethoven, I would never hear of them. The nobility pr uh, promoted, patronized the arts. There was a famous incident, he was playing for them, and somebody began talking. And so he got up and he slammed the cover of the piano down. He said, I will not play before such, well, he used the word swine, okay? Of course, they shouldn't have talked, but neither should he have acted that way. It's a certain uh, a, a way of behavior that comes about because of, again, again, a process bigger than he, because the customs, that's what happens with the gradual deterioration of customs. So this last movement of this sonata, kind of, I mean, he didn't have that in mind, I'm sure, but you can see how that might ex uh, give rise to something like this. About 1800, Beethoven was 30, he noticed that he began going deaf. Well, from 1800 to 1802, got worse and worse, until in 1802, he could still hear, but he realized eventually he won't hear at all. So he left Vienna and went to a town outside there and made a last will and testament to his two brothers, actually planning to give up. He woke one day and said, no, uh, I will not give up. And out came what was his third symphony, which is, which is called Heroic and Heroic. One of the things that he did, which is not played so much, it's, a, it's an entire missa, a mass, a Catholic mass, and he himself wrote on the, the, the score, uh, from the heart to the heart, to increase religious devotion. Well, obviously, he's doing the, 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 the text of the Holy Mass. There's no way, when you, see the, when you hear the credo of that piece, There's no way that he did not believe. There's no way. No one could write something like that if they didn't have faith. Again, the revolutionary historians have liked to play up the fact that he was naturalistic, which he was, uh, was perhaps not the best churchgoer, which he wasn't, but he was born a Catholic and he died a Catholic. Schubert was extraordinary in his own way, extraordinary. He had one of the the greatest melodic gifts ever. And he wrote over 600 songs, they called German songs, art songs. And one of his very famous songs shows the, the, the melodic beauty. Ave Maria. He didn't set the actual Latin Ave Maria to it. He wrote the music and someone else imposed the actual Ave Maria. Unfortunately, of course, Schum uh, Schubert was in the, the whole struggle of the naturalism of the age. And we're in the 19th century now, the Romantic era. The error of it is more than just because it's usually explained as, well, romantic, a person romantic, they want amorous attachments. But this is, that's only the consequence, that's the symptom. The problem is that the person puts themselves in the center. The great Polish composer, Frédéric Chopin, extremely sensitive nature, and he could portray these things very well in music. It is said that he wrote this while there was, he was alone there on the piano and it was raining on the roof.
and later on in the piece, When people heard that, somebody said, it wasn't Chopin, somebody said, hmm, this sounds like rain on the roof. One of the things that happens to people, of course, uh, taken over by uh, Morris attachments, is if this starts to fail, if this falls apart, then they get very, very despondent. He wrote a very famous funeral march, and you can see this. Definitely a sense of tragedy and also and I wouldn't recommend listening to a lot of him for for young men who are going out and, and doing heroic things just kind of get you but here's something that would inspire you to do heroic things. Another one of his very famous ones called the Heroic Polonaise. He's a person who is uh, grandeur in the soul, no? certainly not entirely sentimental. What turned out to be a colossal genius, but a terrible person of the 19th century, uh, Richard Wagner, extremely powerful force of revolution. He had an ego matched by none. There's a person who illustrates this thing of themselves in the center. He was also immensely immoral, uh, had an immense sensuality also. He had to be in the center. It was the center, period. And so he walked over people. He ran up death. He didn't care. He was chased over Europe, all around Europe by all kinds of people. Uh, his debtors, and he managed to escape, uh, was in prison once, got out there. Yeah. It's, it's just a kind of rogue type, but, but had such a power of a conviction, it's scary. Well, one of his earlier operas, Tannhäuser, maybe third or fourth opera in, So when, when Professor Plinio and his friend heard that, he said, oh, look at the seriousness. Wagner had a, uh, when he had, a, especially some of his earlier things, and he had also, also a sense of grandeur, you put the two of the things together, it's quite something. He had some other couple of things, Meistersinger and so forth, that were really impressive. But the problem is that this whole thing went farther and farther, this process, everything is a process, right, with our, everyone. and. When not stopped, it goes to its paroxysm. He had no problem taking other, someone else's uh, wife. As a matter of fact, uh, he was married earlier on, but it just it didn't suit him. This poor lady, Minna, just basically just died. One of his big operas that involved very much the amorous thing, Tristan in Unisolde. Certain point, there is a, a big thing there where it's called the Ah, uh, Liebestod, which means the love death. 
And so basically what this does, is supposed to, to uh, 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 portray here, two people who love each other so much they die. Dangerous stuff. You don't want to listen to Tristan. You should know about it. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> this uh, this ride of the Valkyries is uh, something else. the horsemen running it's just wild wildness okay anyway Wagner ended up his dream was to found an opera place where just that would be performance like a kind of temple pagan temple to Wagner one place I gave this talk and somebody interjected after this said well finally he became God and that's what he thought Franz Liszt one of the greatest pianists that ever lived and we don't have recordings but everything is known about him he just made people swoon, etc. Uh, it, was, it was something. He was not a good composer, really, and he sh mainly he was interested in showing off. So his piano things are very difficult. But just to put the, the nuance here, he wrote one thing, and I'm just going to give a brief way forward to the 20th century when Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira was, at a certain point, uh, with his mother, Donna Lucilia, going through a great trial. And he heard this piece played, and he said, because he already knew, of course, Liszt was very, what we would call revolutionary, okay. He heard this piece played, he said, uh, this has something <clears throat> that uplifts the soul. It, it, it helps me through this trial. It's a very noble thing. And it's a very famous piece of Liszt. beautiful very quite something it has a longer piece I'm not going to do more now it just shows again nuance by no means am I extolling list you understand by no means in a certain sense a battle of revolution and counter-revolution was that Wagner definitely was in the revolutionary as a matter of fact a whole group of people musicians whatnot were following Wagner as the the music of the new age Another great composer emerged at this time, Johannes Brahms. And Brahms was, by his very nature, uh, looked always more towards the, the, the former masters and uh, uh, organizing his compositions along that line. He had a lot to add to it, but one of the great saving things of Brahms is the order and the classical approach that he had. The whole flock of people of the concert going audiences began following Brahms and there were two camps the ones following Wagner as the music of the future and the ones following Brahms as those who were holding on to tradition okay, one of the things that happens with the revolution is becomes people become have an itch for novelty in other words just do something new for the sake of doing it this happened in the case of the French impressionist musicians the famous most famous Debussy Claude Debussy and Debussy had this idea of too, a certain itch for novelty, of doing something new. He was very talented. Uh, Claire de Lune, by the light of the moon. So, 
Yeah, it's what he developed. One of his trademarks was this. Let me just explain very briefly. Inequality. You have two whole steps, a half step, three whole steps, half steps, three note chords, a major one, a minor one, a minor one, another major, another major, a minor, and what's called the diminished. The diminished is neither major nor minor. Three, three majors, three minors, and diminished. Any major scale has that, and they're all formed the same way. If I take a more distant key, like A flat, same series, two holes and a half, three holes and a half, same chords. You could say that's the family of A flat. The first one's the family of C. What Debussy did was this. He became the main promoter of a scale that ended up being called the whole tone scale because it was composed only of whole tones. So if you stay within that scale, you can only do one kind of chord. It's called what's an augmented chord. Augmented, you take a major chord and raise the top one, called augmented. Augmented chord has many nice uses within the normal framework of music, but if you do a piece in whole tone, all you have to work with is augmented chords. Watch the effect of this. I don't know about you, but it's like a haunted house. Because in the major scale, Inequality. If you're in C major, what's the most important note? C. And that chord is the main chord of that, of that key. And the second strongest chord, full of inequality, is the fifth, called the dominant. That's why the strongest cadence in music, a cadence means a concluding, is five. And you give the chords of the scale the seven, uh, seven numbers, according to their degree in the scale. So five. If you're in Western music, there's no stronger ending than that. This third strongest chord is the one, the four chord, called the subdominant because it's right below the dominant. Also very strong. That's why many endings of a symphony or whatever will be four, five, one. The three major ones are called the primary chords, like primary colors for an artist. The one, four. And everything else called the secondary chords, the two, the three, the six, and the seven. With the whole tone scale, every, that's all erased. You have only whole tones. Debussy wrote a lot of music. I mean, he was talented. And uh, he didn't use exclusively the whole tone scale, but he used it a lot. He was very much into the idea of breaking with tradition. He once visited Vienna, where, where Brahms, by the end of the 19th century, Brahms was, was already considered one of the giants, with the real successors of Mozart and Beethoven. Now, Brahms was something. You know. Somebody asked Debussy, well, how was your trip to Vienna? He said, ah, the Viennese, they're only surfeited with Brahms and Strauss. Surfeited meaning like stuffed, you know. He would like to say to him, who do you think you are talking like this? You, who, who, who you have this kind of contribution. Going into the 20th century, one of the, uh, the, the, the composer that really blew the roof off this thing of really being different uh, was this Russian, uh, Igor Stravinsky. He came up with something called the Rite of Spring. It became it's extremely famous. It's considered one of the masterpieces of the 20th century. I don't agree with this at all. What he did here, two things. Besides doing a whole series of chord combinations, extremely dissonant and jarring and so forth, he did two things here that you could isolate, uh, so-called contributions. One was the displaced accent. Having an accent 
where you didn't expect it. You know, so if you take, for example, uh, uh, a symphony of, of, of Schubert, for instance. That's his very great uh, unfinished symphony. You see there's a, a certain pulse there going like this. You could say, well, it's displaced. No, it's three-dimensional. That's going behind, but the melody is where you expect it to be. So that your, your attention is called to... Nothing displaced about it. What he does have there is syncopation. Syncopation is uh, moving some of the notes to where you don't expect them, but w under the framework of completely where the, the, the pulse, should we say, is where it should be. What Stravinsky did here was <coughs> do it completely at random. So you're, you're, you're totally jarred, okay? The other thing here is he, he, he uh, brought, entered the whole thing of, gave an entrance to what we call polytonality, doing two chords or more chords together that never go together. You have two chords, either one that are beautiful. E major chord, E flat seven. They never go together. Either one beautiful. What he did was, deliberately, that's the, that's the polytonality thing, and the displaced accent, so. Rite of Spring is also, uh, there are no words to it, but it's built, built in a, it depicts a pagan rite in Russia or whatever. At the premiere of this Rite of Spring, <clears throat> Debussy was present. He at a certain point said, wow, this is really the music of the future. Back then, the men were less tolerant. They didn't have this thing of tolerance like they had now. So the man sitting next to him heard that and said, how dare you insult my intelligence? This is, this is a, a total disorder. The one on his side sided with Debussy. He said, what do you mean? I think the same as him. So this man punched the other one. His honor was being offended. And the whole place turned into a melee, a brawl, and they had to stop it and redo the, the, the concert. And of course, with the revolution behind promoting these so-called trends that have gotten worse and worse. Uh, some f a couple other famous examples. <clears throat> One is uh, around the same time as Stravinsky, beginning of the 20th century, was a German by the name of Schoenberg, Arnold Schoenberg. And he came up with something, his contribution to so-called originality was what he called the 12-tone roll. I mean, everybody's known those, but Schoenberg's you know, contribution was to say that if you're going to write a piece in 12-tone discipline, 12-tone style, you cannot repeat one of those 12 until you've done all the others. Well, th this is a recipe for, for chaos because uh, in order to make an architecture or a piece of music that makes sense, you have to repeat things. That's a theme, like we heard from Mozart then. It's true, he only does that in the beginning, later he does it again. But it's within a context. And of course, he repeats the same notes again, C, E, G, B, C, A, G, C. How can you make a melody if you don't repeat something? Also, the other thing was, it doesn't matter which one goes together. So naturally, um, uh, they avoided, on purpose, the tones that up until then were said to go together. So, he'd come up with something like this. I, I don't exaggerate. This became very famous. 
uh, notorious, I would say. Well, here's a, let's say, this could be a phrase in a 12-tone piece. Okay. I defy anyone to sing that. Get the most learned professor of composition anywhere to sing it. Come on. They can't. Brahms was once asked what was his formula for a great piece of music. Very simple, two things. One, it has to have a melody that everyone can sing. Second, the melody has to go where it should go. Here's Brahms, who did his this colossal, magnificent symphonies and comes up with this, one of his most famous things, his lullaby. And what mother has not cradled her child with Brahms' lullaby? Then came a couple of other Russians, Kabalevsky, uh, Samuel Barber. This Barber did one very, very impressive thing called Adagio for Strings. Barbara, Barbara had something, I think. But most of them in the 20th century, completely out. Here's one, and this character appeared in the 60s, was very famous, John Cage. What he came up with was this. He came out in Carnegie Hall, <clears throat> concert grand Steinway piano, and just sat there. Then he got up, bowed, and went off. And the, title, and the people looked at the program. The title was 19 Minutes of Silence. Another one of his famous escapades was to come out like that, but instead of sitting silent for 19 minutes, sat down at the Steinway, took out a hammer, get under there and started beating and pulling the strings and then playing on the thing after he had beaten, pulled the strings to pieces. So all this, uh, did all this, bowed and went off. These people in their itch for novelty uh, they lost the truth completely. And of course, when you lose the truth, you go into total chaos. There are very powerful elements pushing these people. That is an intimidating performing artist. As if to say, if they don't perform something of this ilk, they're just not going to make it. That's why almost every major conductor of a, of a major symphony orchestra in the world today they make a habit, they make a, a thing of, of putting in one or two of these outlandish pieces on, on the program. And here's an example of how very famous and very fine artist was intimidated. Middle of the 20th century, it was Italian pianist Maurizio Pollini, concert pianist, first rate. He played, at a certain point, a piece of Stockhausen. And the piece went like this, something like this. And it's got, Imagine this, he has the score there in front of him, so. I don't exaggerate. Uh, this shows the, the degree of uh, really insanity that has been reached and, and how, the, how the, the devil is affecting the whole society through these things. So. Uh, around the turn of the century, with, of course, the Protestantism, uh, came this thing. Oh, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. This became super popular in religious circles. It's a Protestant because it ends with uh, for thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power. Okay, nothing to do with Catholic. Catholic, as you know, is uh, <clears throat> uh, leads not the invitation, liberals from evil. Amen. With the Protestant added the other. That became super popular. 
popular singer in the 50s, 60s, very, very, became very famous. I would say a popular singer like this even has something wholesome compared to what came later. Perry Combe. I believe that somewhere in the great summer, you know that, a candle glows. I believe that somewhere in the great somewhere, da 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 da, then I know why I believe, I believe. Okay, when you heard Perry Como sing this, it's very sentimental words, but you could see that he was sincere, at least on this level. Okay, he believed, I, I believe he had a faith of some kind. This served a lot to promote a certain sentimental idea of religion, and it served to give a kind of a certain tendency to optimism. That is the idea that everything is going to come out all right somehow. The Catholic way is be prepared, hope for the best, be prepared for the worst, right? Then this was picked up by a very famous trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary. We shall overcome someday, then I know why. Yes, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Three of them. Well, they were communists. They were in the communist movement of the 50s and 60s, and they had a completely different intention than Perry Como. So they sang, you know, it's tonal. I mean, they, they harmonize well, and they play the guitar well. Nothing like some of the rock groups that came later. Uh, but the words, if, they, if you knew how to go deeper in there, you see the communism behind that. Uh, then, of course, you had around the same period right after that, Elvis Presley uh, uh, became just a wild sensation, especially amongst teenagers. He was the one that, uh, at whose concert started the thing of, you know, they'd hear him sing and, and these young women, they would just scream or they'd just get down and just, just lie on the floor because as if to say, ah, it is so, it's so wonderful they can't stand it. What a complete disorder. I, I don't want to even play anything that he did. Um, and to make his, he did a lot of really radical songs, but then he threw in one, Love Me Tender. Love me tender, love me. Well, that's different words to a very famous old song from the British Isles, a good song. So it helped be a vehicle to carry people along down the path of revolution. Again, it's a tendency, tendency thing. And so they, some of the adults imagine when they saw that, they say, well, gee, maybe Presley's not so bad. Look at this nice, lovely tender. Uh, I'm going to skip back. Well, it was around the same period. Very famous exponent of jazz, Dave Brubeck. I never was a fan of, of, of jazz. And I am not today, and I never will be, by the grace of God. Jazz is a medium that activates people to just just improvise everything. Everything is of the moment. One of his very famous things was take five. And it's in a kind of strange rhythm because it's five, five beats to a measure, which is, uh, does this a little bit to you, but. unsettling. Anyway, Brubeck, I mean, he at least had that to his credit, that it wasn't all just ephemeral going into the air. Now we're getting into the music that began flooding the church after the changes, after the Second Council. One famous one was this, called Sing of the Lord's Goodness. It's almost an imitation of Brubeck. Sing of the Lord's Goodness, da 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 It 
it's almost the, the, the Tek 5 of Rubek. Of course, now, this has religious words, sing of the Lord's goodness, all you nations. That Here's one of the other big maneuvers, we would say, of the revolution in music, is the idea that you can have sacred words with very disturbed, profane uh, accompaniment. They're all religious words, all taken from the Bible. And so the gullible, the uh, useful innocents, the people who don't think, say, well, that's religious words, must be for God. One of the next big group, very famous, were the Beatles. Very famous, extremely dangerous. The Beatles were talented. They wrote, the, they wrote most of their own things. They played different instruments. And, and they wrote their own words, most of it. The thing is this, because especially the leader, John Lennon, but the others following, of course they knew about this, were into Satanism. In fact, they were one of the ones that discovered, by searching into an old Satanist, Crowley of the turn of the century who said, hey, it's very bad, stay away from him, that if you say something backwards, it's very pleasing to Satan. So the Satanists, they do things backward on purpose. So they do, they, they, the songs, most of the songs of the many songs of the Beatles are done in such a way that when you hear it, it's words that you can understand. But if you turn around and play, it's called backward masking, play that in reverse, you hear a satanic message. Well, in the other satanic groups, uh, unmentionable, unplayable here, ACDC, KISS, uh, Rolling Stones, they never get over the Rolling Stones, they still push it. They have a magazine, Rolling Stones. These were Satanists, hardcore Satanists. If you get this, the songs they, they, they came up with and look at the words, you will be shocked to death. I don't have examples of all this. We could get it, we don't have the time. That now, just coming back to this sing of the Lord's goodness thing, well, this kind of tendency went on and on. One of the worst uh, uh, examples of this, is you have some kind of jazz guitar here or something? This is a so, this is a so-called Lamb of God in the contemporary New Order liturgy. This is already, it was used already more than 20 years ago this came in. So imagine what they're doing now. I, I can hardly sing this, but any, forgive me. Oh, Lamb of God, you take away, you take away. Here illustrates in a dramatic way how words alone cannot mean a good piece of music. Because with this, the, the rhythm, the way of being of the music is so foreign to uh, what we could call a sacral, something that's not necessarily in the sacred realm, that's in the church, but sacral, all of our movements should be sacral, right? Everything with that is a quality of being sacred without specifically in the religious realm, the church in her unction and wisdom when she was guided by holy people uh, imparted this idea to a society. That's how, that's what gave rise to the Middle Ages. So we return to the original chant. On you stay, we holy spectata mundi, miserere no. Sorry, Lord walking in, he would be perfectly content with his music. On you stay, we told his peccata mundi, dona nobis pace. God grant us peace. Well, this is the peace of heaven, huh? One of the last quote I wanted to put was also from Dr. Plinius. Revolution, counter-revolution. What is to be restored? <clears throat> this is chapter two for the counter-revolution. If the revolution is disorder, the counter-revolution is the restoration of order. And by order we mean the peace of Christ and the reign of Christ. 
That is, Christian civilization, austere, hierarchical, fundamentally sacral, anti-egalitarian, and anti-liberal. That's what we're looking forward to, what, what, what we're longing for. Huh? And uh, in the words of Our Lady of Fatima, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. That's coming. Thanks for joining us. And remember to subscribe if you want on YouTube or on iTunes. You can visit our website at tfpstudentaction.org. Thanks again, and Godspeed.